say it's funny that you mentioned that I think in a recent speech Ursula von der Leyen mentioned that China is a sti- state-led capital, a capitalist system. I would be very happy to talk with you if that's even possible or what that would actually entail. But instead of going to that direction, I would like to go back to hard political facts uh, and, and take up the point of resiliency, what Luis also men- mentioned earlier. So we have seen a couple of legisl- legislative proposals coming out from the Commission in the last days. One of them is targeting raw materials. Uh, so the Raw Materials Act of the European Union says that we should be independent of one uh, supplier of raw materials. It doesn't name China as the main beneficiary of this act, but it's quite clear that when you look where the raw materials are coming from, I have numbers, 97% of lithium, what we use for batteries, coming from China. Uh, 98% of all of the rare earths uh, are coming from China, all the minerals, and the EU wants to cut this dependency down to 65% from one supplier meaning China in, in these cases, what I just mentioned. So, Julia, I take you again up. Uh, I, I would start with you as here, because um, on the one hand, I understand that the CHI is something which increases European business uh, possibilities to work in a rules-based order in China. But are the political facts pointing to that direction? Do we even want that? Well, that's a good question. Uh, uh, first, I would, uh, I would argue with you, not against the numbers, but still... Uh, Critical raw materials the problem is not a China problem. It is a China problem too, but it is also much more complex than this. Uh, then, uh, basically, then it, if it's not a China problem, what is it? Uh, I think it's a dependency problem. And as COVID showed us, and then later, unfortunately, the, the Russian war in uh, aggression in Ukraine showed us, vulnerability instantly becomes, uh, dependencies instantly become vulnerabilities in crisis situation, in what situation, in coronavirus or, or other pandemic situation. So we have to tackle those. Uh, the political will, and you ask me about China in this context, the political will, uh, I think that's a very complex discussion because if we look, then we see that also among EU institutions and among Brussels and the member states' capitals, there are significant differences. And we see to our uh, big China stakeholder, which is Germany, of course, mm-hmm. uh, which is at the origins of the uh, Wandel durch Handel idea. And that was also towards Russia, but was also yeah, obviously towards China. And that was also an idea that I embraced uh, personally very very gladly, because I and I still believe that there is some potential in such an idea, uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, is there political will? Could there be the conditions for that political will to be, for example, a majority in the European Parliament? That's debatable. It depends on what happens. You uh, just, uh, uh, we were just discussing before starting this uh, yeah. this live show that uh, that uh, there will be several high-level visits in China in the following days. Those visits will bring us something. I mean, I think. Uh, uh, Commission President von der Leyen or the, the French President Macron or the, our High Representative Borrell, they should come back with something because I think they have an idea when they go to China. Now we saw uh, President von der Leyen hinting to some of her ideas. Uh, we need a China strategy. Uh, we are maybe waiting to see what Germany will tell because, as I told you, Berlin is quite important uh, in, in all, all this equation. So uh, uh, this makes the whole issue very volatile, very complex, and uh, and uh, uh, in these conditions, I think that we are right to and we have to act simultaneously on several uh, 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 initiatives or on several directions. We have to diversify our trading partners. We have to find those trading partners that uh, are able to supply us with critical raw materials or necessary or strategic raw materials in the context of the double transition, but we also have to do some things at home. We have to see what is about how people think in Europe about industry. What about the re-industrialization strategies of the European Union and its member states? How can we convince the public, which in my take became extremely green, but the general public became green without really, in my take, uh, understanding the implications, the deep implications of deindustrializing. Why should not we uh, uh, exploit our own resources because we have them fully in Europe? And finally, how how can we uh, uh, not only uh, uh, 
change mentalities, not only the industrialize, but how can we build up the circular economy and what can it bring to us? Because for the moment, I think we are unsure, technically speaking, about how much of the critical raw materials uh, necessi necessities could be covered in future, in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, with new technologies from yeah. the circular economy. You mentioned now um, the industrialization and so forth. What I th that, that's all valid points. I would still go back a little bit because this is a China-related discussion to kind of the dependencies that we have. I know that the very good sentence, what you just mentioned, dependencies come vulnerabilities. We need to diversify. We need to de-risk, as the commission uh, has, has put it um, in, in recent communications. So now I'm turning to the business side um, of the table again and fully knowing that you are not representing Germany here or German companies, but I would like to take out of my home country an example, Volkswagen, which has around 40% of global revenues and pretty much the same amount of global profits based in China and has also announced for more, um, for more um, investments in China. Is this how European diversification and de-risking looks like? Well, uh, the companies are free to, to take their own decisions uh, and uh, we don't and should not mingle in the decisions of the companies because they know better what their business model is and what could be the success factors in the future. What we are saying is, of course, we are giving uh, indications of what are the challenges ahead in our relations with, with China. We do have a very complex relation, it's true. Uh, we, we depend... Uh, on some critical raw materials from China. But also, I, I, I tend to say that uh, China also depends on our market to sell a lot of their goods. So it's not that this is dependency works also only on one way. Uh, it also works in our favor. So I also mm. think we need to use more that leverage that we have because, of course, China cannot afford to lose their two main markets, and that's the US and Europe. China is not yet and cannot yet only depend on its own market if they want to continue to grow at an enough pace to continue to have jobs for their citizens and improve the livelihood of their citizens. So I think this is also important. Then we need, of course, to, and I totally agree with what Julia said, we need to diversify. And, and this is, we need to mitigate the risk. And we have, for sure, to look for alternatives in Europe when they exist. But we also need to be very clear that some of these alternatives in Europe will not be easy, will not happen from one day to the other, and they might be more costly. So we need to see if there are other partners there which could be an alternative to China or to other countries with which we depend too much. And that's why we also think it is really the moment to push for our bilateral trade agenda when it comes to trade agreements. We need not only to, in, to have more partners with which we can trade in terms of imports and having more access to raw materials, talking about lithium, Chile is definitely mm -hmm. an alternative as well. We also need, of course, to look for other alternatives for our exports. If the situation with China or other markets becomes more difficult, we will need to find alternatives. And therefore, I, I think an agreement, for instance, like Mercosur, is one that could be really a, a real alternative, as well as India, if we manage to, to do something with India. So we need to have a mix of policies. And this has always been what we have defended with, with China. We need to be using our own leverage as Europe. And this also means we need to talk with one voice. So it's very good that President von der Leyen goes with President Macron. This means that there is some alignment between EU and a, a member state, because some, well, in the past we saw a lot of situations where member states were going to China, and, and then we had contradictory views. So it's very important that we speak with, with one voice, that we align our policies, and we align our dialogue and our message vis-a-vis -vis China. It's also important that we will continue to engage with China. I mean, the worst we can have is a situation where we don't talk, we start building more and more frictions, and this could eventually lead to more problems. We need to, we have an interest in engaging with China. I mean, global challenges like climate change, even standardization, I mean, these are areas where we have an interest in engaging with China. 
And and I think we should not close the door to this dialogue. On the contrary, whenever possible, we need to we need to go deeper, being quite realistic and pragmatic to understand that maybe China does not share the same model. It's very clear the the same political model, even the same economic model. So we need to be pragmatic, but this doesn't mean closing the dialogue. I I have one question which I will uh, present uh, to. to Julio here, Mr. Julio Winkler. Um, Luisa basically uh, announced a couple of priorities which she, uh, on behalf of Business Europe, thinks is very important to engaging. Uh, you mentioned trade agreements, you mentioned diversification, you, you mentioned openness of markets, uh, engaging with other partners, just a couple of examples. So looking at elections, as we are uh, looking at European elections in the year 2024, why should or should Europeans care about the economic uh, discrepancies between Europe and China? How does this look for a normal person's viewpoint? I think uh, many of our citizens are attentive to China, to problems related to China. By the other hand, uh, you know that uh, any politician sitting in this chair would tell you that all elections are local. So it's uh, very clear that uh, if I go back to 2014, then uh, the TTIP, the Transatlantic mm. Partnership, was really a, a, an election topic in the European elections in 2014. TTIP and CETA, but where? In Germany and France mainly, and in some other Western European countries. It was zero degree topic in Romania or in Bulgaria or in Hungary, in Eastern Europe. So clearly, uh, we might speak about those issues uh, like, uh, for example, linked of dependencies in Romania, that is a public talk about depend, being dependent on China, on solar panels, on inverters, or on uh, electric cars, or batteries, or so on. Uh, then I think uh, the climate change issues are popular in other member states. I mean, it's clearly that you cannot really uh, tackle my, uh, climate change without China, because it's so huge, and because it's such a big polluter. Then in maybe other uh, member states, uh, the situation of counterfeit products linked with China or the situation of uh, debatable production methods, human rights, uh, uh, child labor, forced labor and so on, also linked with China could be also problems in the platform of the political parties. But finally, I would say, so I think in each member states you will have differences. Uh, probably China could be or will be a bigger or a smaller issue in elections, depending on the member states. But what I would say to all uh, uh, European citizens uh, now, if I could, is the following. Uh, it's clear that China, together with Russia, are the main actors on the disinformation market and the fake news market in all European Union member states. Probably we are closer, I mean Eastern Europe is closer to Russia and it's subjected to more Russian interference, but uh, a Chinese interference, as it was also debated and proved in the, the committee uh, of the European Parliament, which was working with foreign interference, uh, it's clearly an actor present in all the member states and probably this presence will be increasing as we uh, come closer and closer to the elections. I took from this uh, topics, trade relations will continue with China. We are pushing for equal market access. We are trying to be more autonomous, uh, be aware of our risks that we have there. And for elections, look for trade uh, topics, look for disinformation topics and make uh, your politicians aware that China and Russia are major player in this. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you both for taking the time today, for coming here. I think we all learned something and we should build on these China competencies and make both the politicians and the public more aware why do we need to engage. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.